Good morning, everyone. Uh, apart from Greg, in which case it's good evening, uh, being in Australia. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. I'm delighted to have industry legend Greg Savage with me today to give us an insight into how to make yourself in a fit and proper state in case a recession comes. But, but as importantly, I mean, making yourself recession fit also is sensible to help grow the business and having it lean and mean in some ways but being able to maximize profitability from each individual working in your business. So I'm sure Gray's going to share a whole lot of wisdom in, in regard to that. Now, I use the word legend, um, and I don't you, you know, choose that word lightly, because um, I first came across Greg when I was presenting for the RCSA in Australia, probably 2005. And it was incredible, the audiences he was drawing back then. Um, you know, he's, he's built and sold successful recruitment businesses, floated them on... Uh, the stock markets, and just done a whole lot of good things for the industry, particularly with the Industry Trade Association, the RCSA over there. Um, I'm a big fan of your work, Greg. Delighted to have been to have bought your book recently, The Savage Truth. Um, and uh, I think the reviews of that were talking about it having humor and absolutely made me chuck on a few old things from that. Looking forward to finishing it, by the way. Um, more importantly, delighted to have you here today to share your your thoughts and your wisdom and the things that you've learned even your own failures i suppose things that you go wrong um you know as you grow a business i particularly like um i think it was michael jordan's quote where he said that um failure isn't the opposite of success it's part of it so uh, and i think your book contains not just your successes but the things you got wrong which i love because there's a real learning uh, experience from that so a pleasure to have you here um looking forward to your presentation and uh, over to you now greg yeah, thank you very much, Mike. And it's a total pleasure to be on your webinar. Uh, I'll pick you up on a couple of things. Thank you for buying my book. That's, that's uh, clearly the one sale I've had so far. So I appreciate that. <laughs> and um, the word legend, that, that is hilarious. Um, I'm, I'm in my sort of study upstairs. I've got a son two doors down and another one below. If they heard you using that word in relation to me, it would be hilarity all around. So thank you. Uh, but there's no fans in this house. Uh, as big as you. So thank you for that, Mike. Well, nice to have a bit of humility as well, Greg, and uh, thank, <laughs> thank you for that. So um, we've got some questions that have come in, and uh, in the chat room, if, uh, if any participants to this webinar would like to ask Greg a question as we go along, please put the questions in the chat room. But the first one that's, that's come through in advance, Greg, is this one. Why talk about recession? Do you really think one is imminent? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a fair question, and I'm not predicting a uh, recession soon. How would I know? Who am I to predict a recession? I'm not an economist and they normally get it wrong anyway. But what I am doing is I'm predicting a recession sometime because it's going to happen. Uh, economic cycles tell us that, history tells us that. And I do get a little edgy when I realize that it's 10 years since the last big one. So I'd have to say, if I, if I was asked to put my uh, money on the table, I'd say we're closer to the next recession than we are from the last one. I, I, I would say it's a bit like if you lived in the Caribbean, you don't have to know whether a cyclone is coming tomorrow to predict that a cyclone is coming. It is coming and it will come. And therefore, if you lived in the Caribbean, which is a cyclone prone area, you would be prepared. Your house would be prepared. Your infrastructure, your supplies, you'd have an escape plan. You'd have, um, people would have roles, but you wouldn't need to know the recession was coming tomorrow. You just need to know, oh, sorry, the cyclone was coming tomorrow. You would just need to know that it was coming. And it will come, and I do get nervous that uh, myself, and I, in my book, I talk about this because I've been through several recessions and I still got blindsided by them, that we get complacent and we, we sort of, we're bad at remembering history and we believe it won't happen again and was it really that bad anyway. So, no, I'm not predicting one tomorrow, I don't know, but I sense something's looming and uh, whether it's in a year or two or three, it will happen. And our industry will be, in the main, very unprepared for it, Mike. That's how I feel about it. Interesting. And, uh, you know, we've got participants on this webinar from all over the world, Greg. But, of, of course, over here in the UK, we've got Brexit, which is looming. So, um, mm. you know, and, and that, that's a concern, obviously. So... I've lost you. Can you see my screen no now, Greg? 
Yeah, I, I can see the, a screen, yep. Okay, got the next question on, on the screen there. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, the first thing is I'll just pick up uh, from, from what I was saying before is um, we do get complacent. We do not realize um, there's many people who be owning recruitment businesses now who didn't go through the last recession or were maybe very junior at that time. And I don't think people realize the severity of the revenue fall. I'm talking about a proper downturn now. Um, nor do we see the weaknesses in our business. And, and again, in my book, I talk about how cocky I got. I mean, I wouldn't have felt at the time I was cocky, but uh, I'll tell you this war story in a moment. The business was going so well, thought it was all our cleverness, nothing to do with the rising market. And we paper over the cracks. We don't see our weaknesses in a boom market. We're so busy focusing on the nice profits we're making. And um, we gloss over infrastructure issues. And um, I, I think that um, uh, this is the problem that people don't understand how fast revenues will decline. So let me give you a couple of stories because I think, I think they, 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 they cut through the rhetoric. When I started Recruitment Solutions, yes, it was in the 80s. And some people will laugh how long ago that was. But trust me, all recessions are the same in terms of how much they hurt. Um, and uh, our business grew. You know, we, we, we started with 10 people and... After three years, we had, we had $13, $14 million of revenue. We had five offices after three years. Um, Self-funded, and away we went. Well, I can tell you this. In 1990, the beginning of 1990, our business was handling, on average, 250 permanent job orders. I know this because every office had to fax me their jobs on a Monday morning. And, and I trended them, and I could see it, and 250 was the average. Within eight months, that number had dropped to 18. So from 250 permanent job orders to 18. Our, our revenues dropped from 13 million to about nine, and they didn't recover for two or three years. Um, our staff, we had to cut back from 70 to 30. We closed two offices. Great candidates were queuing up at the door. We never ran ads, and I'm talking about great candidates. Um, pot plants that were hired were wheeled out the door. We had no admin staff. Everyone's salary had to be cut by 10%. And let me tell you, in that year, 60% of recruitment companies in Australia and New Zealand went bust. We, we didn't. We hung on. Um, so we actually did well in, in comparison. And, um, you know, a, a temp test that was taking on average 30 or 40 jobs a week, I remember one particular week where we took one. It was 4 o'clock on a Friday, and it was for a one-day credit control clerical job. That's what happens in a downturn. And I also recall uh, me saying to, uh, I was more of a sales management guy of the three of us who founded it. And the finance guy said, you know, I said to him, we're going to sell our way out of this. Don't worry, I'll get the consultants out there. And he said, well, you do that, but we're going to cut the cost. So we cut our costs from 550000 a month. I I'm very good with these figures because I've just, you know, researched them for my book, down to two two twenty five, and we still only broke even. So I think people don't realize the extremes of the revenue drop and the steps you have to take. And if you want to know why we survived, I would say there were three or four reasons. Number one, we had a significant temporary business. And I'm going to come back to that uh, in one of the questions that I know is looming. Uh, and, and that annuity revenue was much more resilient in the downturn. And there's a massive blessing for everyone on this call. If you're all permanent, I would be nervous. No matter how much money you're making, I would be very nervous. That was the first thing. The second thing is we had no debt. And I said in a lot of, I'm on the board of 14 recruitment and HR tech companies. And a lot of them are making money, uh, but they don't collect their debts very quickly. And they borrow a lot to expand. And they, one of them wanted to borrow bloody money to pay a dividend the other day. And even though I wasn't an owner, I kicked up such a fuss, they, they didn't do it. But, but to borrow, to get into debt that you can service on your high profits without thought of what happens if our revenues drop significantly a problem and so we didn't have debt we had high uh, uh, um, percentage of our GP came from revenue and we cut our costs very fast and uh, and we also had some uh, some very skilled recruiters which I'll come to later so that was one story Mike I'd like to tell another which was Aquent I was the international CEO of Aquent which is a marketing recruitment company um, it's an American company and by international CEO they mean all their business outside America but that became quite a big business uh, we had 30, 30 offices in 17 countries. And I ran it from here. And I've got some figures for you. In 2005, the revenue of that business was 64 million. Um, and I'll just give you the revenue for the next five years. 64, 
176, 107, 114. That's four years. So it went from 64 to 114. This was the period that I was thinking, well, we know how to do this. In 2009, the 114 million dropped to 64. We dropped $50 million in revenue in 12 months. And our GP went from $50 million to 22. It halved. GP meaning gross profit or net fee income. It halved. Right? And it, it totally exposed those weaknesses and flaws and cracks. And, and they were mainly around being too permanent in some offices. As I said before, they were around um, weak management who retreated behind their desks and put their head over budgets and didn't get out and lead, which I'll come to later if, if that question is asked, how to handle it in a recession. Um, so there were, there were a number of reasons, but to close office is very, very painful. It's all outlined in the book. And I'm very blunt about my, my mistakes there because, you know, I'm 62, who gives a continental anymore? I think it's just very important to look back and learn from them. And I remember talking to the director for Australia in that same business, and he told the story about me, um, which I've forgotten. He said in October 2008, when Lehman Brothers happened, our Australian permanent business was $485,000 a month in permanency. Sorry, 585. And, and don't worry about pounds, dollars. It's just the, it's just the change I want to get across. 585,000 a month on average. In November, after Lehman Brothers, it dropped to 184. 585 to 184. In December, it was 112. Anyway, apparently he tells me, he and I went for a beer and I told him that month, don't worry, mate. By March, it will all have come back. That's what I said. Well, he told me that it took until 2013 to get back to the 2008 number. And we laughed about how wrong I'd been once again. So I guess my message is, you, they, people talk about softenings and you know little issues that happen. And it hurts a little bit. In Australia, people are whinging because there's, there's a little bit of a drop off in job order demand, but they forget that we've had 10 years of growth. It's actually still great. And, and, and so many of them have no idea. How would they deal with a 50% drop in permanent fees and a 25% drop in net temporary margin, which wouldn't even be a severe recession, it'd be a bad one, but it wouldn't even be the worst. And so I'm not telling these horror stories to, to make anyone nervous. I'm just saying, it's happened five times in my career. So what would you think would be the reason why it won't happen again? So that's my, that's my concerns, Mike. And those are some stories which, uh, which resonate with me and make me, in my meetings of very high, highly profitable companies, I, I spoil the mood lately by asking these well, questions. What would do, happen? Do, do you know what, Greg? I think the, uh, everyone in the good times is high-fiving and, and you know, rightly so, obviously. It's fun, isn't it? But yeah. um, to look at cost savings in your business uh, on a routine basis, I mean, I'm non-exec of a couple of recruitment companies. And, and, and in one, uh, we looked at um, proactive cost savings. Um, not, not, this is waste, actually waste in the business. Yeah. And we got the finance person to create a proactive cost saving report, which they got incentivized on uh, for any cost savings they could identify. It's incredible. And this is from a, yeah. a business where they're saying we run a tight ship and, you know, we've got things under control. So... You know, there's yeah, always yeah. a cost saving in some description and uh, keeping it more profitable is a good thing in any case. But the, question, the next question for you, Greg, is because that's a little bit scary for people listening. Yeah. And you, you quite rightly said you're not looking at scaremongering. But uh, what, circling the wagons, is that what you're saying? Well, I'll, I'll answer that question, but I just love the little story you told because that's the kind of behavior and mindset that I encourage people to uh, um, follow when the times are good you know we need to we need to have a discipline about and it's not about saving money for saving money's sake it, you should spend money where there's a return i love spending more money in the good market on, on on clever marketing and technology and people but don't waste it ever because you know we have the seven fat years then we have the seven lean years so do i say so no the thing is and this is and you touched on this very eloquently in your introductory remarks it's not binary you don't have to say oh we predict a recession, we're going to go on a, some different path that is now contrary to growing profits and growing the business. Um, you don't have to say we have a recession strategy or non-recession strategy. I mean, if a recession hits, you've got to have a recession strategy. But prior to that, what, what, what you need to understand, and I think you said almost these words, is that um, what protects you in a recession is very close to what makes you most profitable in the good times. Not exactly the same. There are a few steps that are different, but mostly it's the same. So 
it is about getting recession fit. It's about running scenarios. And the one I give, as I wish I mentioned, is what would happen if your GP dropped by 50% in perm and 25% in temp? Do a PNL. How does it look? How ugly is it? Would we survive? Because it happens within a space of six weeks, and uh, six weeks, I should say, and it doesn't recover. Uh, and your cost saving exercises. And, and take my cyclone analogy that I started with. If, if the cyclone came, which is the recession, of course, in our, in, in our terms, how strong are we? What's our plan? What's our contingency around cost base, around people, around strategy? And, and, and you can take actions now that will protect you if there's a downturn, but also make you more profitable in the good times. So um, your reception preparation doesn't hamstring your good times growth. Mark, I guess that's, uh, that's the philosophy, I believe. Excellent. You know, I filmed a video with Romney Rawls, who was the founder of Select, and Romney made, four, I think, £3 million a year net profit in his fourth year of trading when he, when he was driving that business forward. And uh, he told me a story of when, uh, you know, this kind of thinking, Greg, and he said mm. uh, he cut back advertising in December. And uh, they were, all the recruiters were, you know, complaining and saying, oh, no, we won't be able to get the candidates. And uh, profitability went up in December because they had to, be, they had to find different ways to source the candidates. It's interesting. So there's always a way to, to save money, I think, in, in a business, as you, as you kind of point out. But having said that, what are the characteristics of a recession-proof or resilient business in that, in that circumstance, Greg? Well, I think we should start with just thinking about our business mix. Um, and by the way, I, I can't help but just picking up on, sorry, uh, on your points about advertising because I see people spending money on job board advertising, which, gener which, which, which not only costs a fortune, but, but also generates vast streams of inappropriate candidates that clog up the system and get their consultants spending hours and hours feeling really busy but being totally unproductive. And, and in fact, some of the pricing models in this country for job boards is you pay, you pay a subscription sort of model and um, you pay whether you use the ads or not. So the consultants just run the ads because they're there to be run on the thought of, oh, let's get some candidates. But they'd be much better if they spent more time talking to their current candidates and making the match and doing those sorts of things. So um, even that is a recession-proof strategy because you're going to have a lot of consultants who have zero skills to operate in, 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 in a down market. That, we'll come to that later. But when it comes to, 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 to business mix, I must come back to, to the, um, and I want to talk about gross profit, right? And I think we all know what that means. It's permanent placement fees and net temporary margin. Um, I believe you need 60 to 70% of your GP coming from a temporary contract or, or other annuity stream. Now, people often misunderstand me. They think I don't like PERM. I love PERM. It's extremely profitable. I was a firm recruiter myself and I love it, but it is an absolutely unfaithful revenue partner. It will drop like a lead balloon and anyone who's been in the industry for a period of time will know that. And so what will typically happen in a downturn, and there are slightly different ones, is that as companies feel the economy or the, uh, or the confidence change, they cut back on permanent hiring dramatically. You know, take my example of 250 job orders a month on average at Recruitment Solutions to 18. I'd say, how can you run a business on that? Well, you can't actually. Um, you, needed, you needed a big number of temporary and contract. So I encourage people right now to, you know, if they're making a lot of money in permanent and a lot of people are, I'm not saying stop doing it. I'm not saying take the foot off the accelerator on permanent. I am saying leverage your relationships to grow a contracting or some other annuity revenue stream, which is going to be temporary or contract or maybe it's RPO or something a little sexier and funkier. But really, we need, uh, we need that. And if you, I mean, if you do not have that annuity revenue stream and a big downturn comes, you will either go bust or, or your business that you were calculating was, was valued at 10 million pounds will in fact be three of you operating around your kitchen table. And, and that's how you'll survive. So that's the first thing, Mike. Very important I make that point. Okay, th thank you, Greg. Um, the next question we have is about verticals, really. What's your, what's your feeling on yeah. next? Well, I'm always, I mean, it's kind of, I feel a bit conflicted because I've been um, banging on for some years about that niche is good 
uh, and being in a deep vertical is good. And, you know, I followed that with uh, a Clinton firebrand and most of the businesses I've been involved in. And I like it because it gives you credibility. I think it, it, it gives you sort of an advisor status. It, it positions you as an expert if you're very deep in a niche. Gives you the access to candidates that others can't find typically, which is really the nirvana in recruitment. But I suppose I've come to feel you've got to be careful about being over niched, Mike. You know, where you're so deep in a tiny niche, you may own that market, but what happens if that little market gets disrupted? You go with it. So I think being niche is good, but a few complementary niches that give you a little bit of a hedge might be might be wise and. Um, that flows on to talking about, you know, your your client mix, which I know is going to be your next uh, your next question. And I think you need to think hard about which of your clients, whether you whether you're leveraged to, to clients who are very vulnerable in a downturn. So, so for example, if we look at what happens, they're typically not not typically, but often recessions start because of some cataclysmic issue in financial markets. A massive stock market collapse, the Lehman Brothers sort of prime lending issue, which you know I still don't fully understand. But it was the finance area that took the brunt of it. So if you are only in that area uh, and you feel the winds of change, you should think it were the winds of, um, of a downturn, you should, you should think hard about that. So um, smart diversification is clever. So, I mean, a simple example, very simple. You're an accounting recruiter. Okay, well, you don't want to diversify into marketing. It's another whole different area or into, or into you know, engineers, you know, it's like starting another business. But if you're an accounting recruiter, why wouldn't you make really sure that you were very, very deep into the insolvency firms? Because if there was a downturn, they, they would not be going by, right? So, I mean, that's just a very trite example, um, but, but around making sure your client base is less vulnerable, because if they're vulnerable, then you, you are obviously vulnerable. Another danger, Mike, would be having no flagship clients, the phrase I use, uh, and by that I mean, and a lot, of, a lot of recruitment companies do not even have any, let alone a few. A flagship client is where your revenues are deep and entrenched. You know, you've got many points of contact. We're very fond of our industry saying, oh, that's my client. You know, Commonwealth Bank, and let me try on that, you know, Barclays Bank is my client. Well, Barclays Bank has got a million staff, and we've got one contact at Barclays Bank. They're not really your client, are they? They're just a transaction that could easily be wiped away. But if, we, if they're a flagship client, we've got 20 points of contact there. We're providing five different revenue streams, you know, accounting staff, um, business support staff, um, temps, contractors, permanent. Um, I think the danger is if you don't have flagship clients, your, 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 your relationships are all very transactional. They're all at very junior consultant level. And that will evaporate in a downturn because clients will flock back to the relationships that are based on trust and credibility. And so where we have superficial, if you go through your clients and, you know, I, I do it with companies, I say, show me your top, your top 25 clients by revenue. And, you know, they're all very, very scattered. There's, you know, 20 grand there and 50 grand there and 100 grand there, but no real flagship client. Um, the flip side of the flagship client argument, which is, while valid, is that you don't want to be too reliant, Mike, on one or two clients. And I've seen that countless times. The PL looks fabulous. We're making a lot of money. But when we dip into it, we see that it's propped up by one, two, maybe three very big clients who, who, who contribute 40, 50% of the total GP. And again, it's so obvious, right? That if I lose, and I've said this in a board meeting last week, this two, these two clients give us 40% of our GP. If we lost those two clients, where we have no contractual relationship, okay? There's no PSL or anything like that. It's just goodwill. If for whatever reason, there was a change of attitude from those clients, we lose 40% of our GP. We go broke on Monday morning. And they looked at me as I was come from Mars. And, and they, you know, a couple of the directors said, well, we're not, we're not likely to lose them. And I said, are you prepared to put your house and your family's future on? And so it was an unpleasant meeting, but I think an important one. I think you don't want actually any client to have more than 10% of your GP. Now, obviously, if you've got a client that's growing, you don't say we don't want any more of your business. What you do is you target the consultant's energies on other clients so we mitigate and spread our risk. So those are some of the things you can do right now. And all those things are going to make you more profitable. They're not defensive in the sense that you are um, um, receding. Uh, they're defensive in that they make you stronger and more resilient market. Well, it's, it's, it's fascinating, Greg. And I think asking the uncomfortable question at the board meeting is, is mm. critical. 
Um, yeah. A board meeting I was on a few years ago and they had 93 clients. And, and I said, what's the cross fertilization in each client for contract and permanent spend? And they didn't really know the answer. Mm. And the action was mm. we've got a spreadsheet uh, for the next board meeting um, through, um, you know, through a projector screen onto the wall. And um, in the left column, you'd have permanent spend. In the right column, you'd have contract spend. It was incredible. You'd have 150,000 spend on the left and nothing on the right and so on. Yes. And, uh, yes. you know, everybody in that board meeting had their mouths open looking at this thinking, we've missed a trick here. But as importantly, we've got a positive action now to go out and develop those accounts better than we are doing. And it was under their noses that they just couldn't see it, really. Yeah, it's, it's another, another great story, Mike. And, and I have seen that. I, I have been guilty of that plenty of times. But I've also, because I, 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 while I'm slow, I eventually learned, I'm now asking the same sorts of questions and doing similar exercises. And it's so obvious that, that it's low hanging fruit. And it also, you know, if you're doing 150 grand in permanent with a client, and then you could also get 10 contractors in there over a period of time, not only is it the money, but it's the, it's the touch points and you're blocking out your competitors and you're dealing with five different contracts there, not one. And they're much stronger. They become a flagship client. So these are actions that, that you take now, you know, it's like before the cyclone hits, and it will make you much more profitable in the good time. It'll make you much stronger in the, in, the, in the downturn. But it's not all about revenue. It's also about costs, isn't it, Mike? Absolutely. And the next question is related to that. Uh, Greg, what are your thoughts on that, please, or tips? Well, this is where your comment about uh, the, the, the CFO giving an exercise to look at costs is important. I would encourage you, well, by you, I mean anyone who owns a recruitment company or is to really look at your fixed costs. We know, right, that 60, 70, I, 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 can, I can tell anybody on this call what's on their P&L. And what is on their P&L is that 60 to 70% of their total costs are made up of staff salaries. And while it's painful and expensive to cut staff, it can be done. What is more difficult is cutting real estate costs, job board contracts, and other deals that lock you in. And they can't be reduced as revenues fall. And even a softening can kill you. And I, I've noticed as, um, as the markets have gone well, even, even in the UK, and you know, as they recently, Mike, because you very kindly bought me a beer about two weeks ago. Um, and I speak to a lot of um, owners of recruitment companies. Brexit is pissing everyone off quite rightly, and people are a bit nervous quite rightly, but we've done pretty well in the UK in the last 10 years, notwithstanding all of that. And we've done pretty well in Australia and right across most of the, uh, the countries I'm involved in. And, 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 and I um, get very distressed when I see people going out and taking two floors of fancy offices with a view of, uh, you know, Sydney Harbour. Why? Why do we do that? And I go into those offices and I walk past interview room after interview after interview room and they're all empty. Or there's 10 interview rooms of which three are being used. And that is ego by the owners. And it's, it's, it's dangerous. Not only that, if you dig deeper, sometimes they negotiated very long leases and they're proud of it. I negotiated a 10 year lease and I got a 10% discount. Well, I'd rather pay 10% more and get a three year lease so I can get out of it if I have to. And not only that, Mike, they don't understand the, the rules surrounding their lease. So they, some of them, find that they've taken space for 50 staff, literally. Here's a classic. They've got 20 staff. They take an office with a view of Sydney Harbour to the marble bloody reception. That's big enough for 50 staff. And then a recession comes and they get down to five staff. Now they're in a 50 person office with five staff. And guess what? I come along or somebody comes along and says, sublet it to somebody else. At least mitigate your expenses. And they go to their lease and they don't have a sublet clause. They can't and they go bust. The last, the last time I moved Aikland, I moved it into a fully set up office. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. It's a, and it felt like jumping into a dead man's grave, to be honest with you, because it, it, it was literally had targets on the walls and consultant of the month trophy still in the office when we walked in. And there was no fit out costs. We got half the rent because they'd just gone through a downturn and they'd gone, they'd gone bust. So the smart thing is, you know, I often say to people, they say, we've got to have 10 interview rooms. Why do you have to have 10? Because sometimes we, we've got 10 people being interviewed. Well, I'd rather have five interview rooms with two people being interviewed in the coffee shop 
then 10 interview rooms of which five are empty 90% of the time, because that is going to destroy your profit or at least reduce it, but actually destroy you in the market uh, terms. So I, I, I like people to, when they make these locked in type decisions like real estate and, and other deals to, to then say, what happens if our revenue drops? Do we really need to do this? And do we really need to be in an A grade building? When it comes to the, you know, I'm very, very strong on this, you know, our building, our office space needs to be um, comfortable enough that our, our, staff, our staff feel respected, safe and comfortable, and that candidates think it's reasonable. Our clients very, almost never come there, even though we say they do. And if they do come there, they don't want to see the marble reception desk. They don't want to see the view of the Sydney Harbour because they think all their fees are going to that, which they are. And they don't want to see that. But I see it happening all the time. It's happening in Sydney at the moment. Um, and it is a precursor to uh, once successful companies are falling on very, very tough times. So those are some of the things, Mike, that I think about uh, costs. Very, very interesting, Greg, and thought provoking. I think an anyone listening to this can go back and have a look at their cost base and also their office contracts and lock-in contracts you know, for various supplies mm. that they're receiving. But I filmed a video recently with David Higgins, who was the founder of Harvey Nash, which I think he grew from mm. four or five people to $600 million global turnover. And he was talking about the critical importance um, as the business gets to a certain size of having a razor sharp FD who does this thinking proactively on your behalf. So just building on that, what, 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 what would your thoughts be on that? Having the right advisor, not, not a firm of chartered accountants who does the books at end of year, but somebody proactively doing that thinking for you if it's not your bag yourself, really. Well, most of us who run recruitment companies don't come from a finance background, and, and uh, we, we may have got quite astute at understanding a P&L and a balance sheet and even a cash flow. But what you've just said is, is very insightful and took me sort of 20 years to learn, to be honest with you, so I'm slow as usual. But in the last 20 years, I've always in my own businesses paid extra for a proactive, um, a strong personality, a commercial thinking finance person who would come to me and say, look at this number. This is a mistake. We must do something. And as I'm about to do something, no, Greg, I wouldn't do that. And, you know, and I'd get a bit annoyed. And then I'd say, no, but this is why. And then I'd say, thank goodness. Uh, you can get a lot of good people who will give you great, great data. And there's a place for those people. But I think if you're going to go a recruitment company, you know, these sorts of things I'm saying, I've learned over a long period of time, um, and there's a lot more of them. So, you, so I completely agree. And, 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 and certainly, when, when I was running Aquint, which was in 15 countries, or 17, I think it was in the end, um, man, I, I just couldn't have done it without a smart finance person. And when it comes to recruitment solutions, well, one of the three of us was a chartered account, and he was exactly that sort of person. And that was one of the reasons for the success of that business. Um, the main reason was the three of us who founded it had totally complementary skills. And this is sort of getting off track, but he had the fun. So he would, you know, I was the sales guy and the people guy and the sort of, you know, let's take over the world. And he was, he was quietly thinking the same thing, but he was always like, well, what about that number? And what's the consequence of that action? And you need that. So I love that. I love that thinking. It's very true. But thank you, Greg. And nice to, uh, to hear that. Um, of course, the main cost is staff in, in any recruitment business. So what are your thoughts on the next question? Yeah, well, that's true. As I said, it's 60, 70% of your cost and it's, it's what absorbs all our time and all our money. Um, and also it's the leverage point, right? You can't grow a business without um, one that's got any value anyway, without multiple income areas. And that's my first point. You know, in, in Australia, and I'm pretty sure it's the same in the UK, 80% of recruitment companies have less than 10 staff, right? So with 10 staff, you can get quite profitable, but you are also usually not very sustainable. You are not very resilient. And, uh, and this, this will be true of, you know, if someone comes to buy your business and they look under, under your petticoats and they see what you really are, now you're making a profit of 2 million pounds, that's very exciting. But 1 million pounds is being built by two people, well, that's a problem. And that's also a problem in a downturn. So if we've got too few income producers, even if you're profitable, particularly perm, there can be four of you sitting in a room and you can make a lot of money, but it, 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 you're highly vulnerable. So two to income producers is high risk. Reliance on one or two or three recruiters is high risk. And there are plenty of recruitment companies, about 10 recruiters, 
but actually 70% of the billing is coming from two people. And if, if, if in a downturn, if those, one of those two people leaves or both leave or, or they lose their mojo, you are up the proverbial creek. So um, I think that's important to look at. And you should do it now. You should do an audit of your people. I'm going to say audit. I don't mean that in a bureaucratic way. But sit back and say, if, if our revenues drop, that's what that savage idiot said. If they did drop 50% in perm and 25% in temp, who are the consultants we'd keep? Who'd survive? Who'd, who'd survive in this uh, post, uh, uh, what's the word that is? Apocalyptic uh, era of, of revenue and, and job flow and all the rest of it dropping. Because if your recruiters are all lightweight, you know, what I like to call flat track bullies, to use one of my many cricket metaphors, um, who can bill when job orders are flowing in the door, they can make the match, they can attach it, but they're not really, they've got no grunt, they've got no relationship, they've got no business development skills, they can't network, they can't open doors, they've got no influencing skills. And what I've described is probably 80% of recruiters. If all your recruiters are like that, well, when the, when the worm turns and, and the jobs are not there, they've got to be fought for, they've got to be sought out, and they've got to be won through credibility, then you're in big trouble. Uh, so I think those are some things to think about. Another thing is I often hear people saying to me, well, we're an accounting recruiter, but we've got a business support division and we're also doing marketing. So we've got three divisions. And I look at that. The business support division is two people and the marketing division is one person. Now she's building 500,000. So that's very profitable, but we're in marketing now and we're in business support. But if she leaves, you're no longer in it. So the critical mass to be in a market is five at least. Right? So don't tell me you're in business support when there's two people, because one gets pregnant and one follows his girlfriend to Queensland, and that's the end of your business support business, because no one else knows how to do it or is interested in doing it. So if you're going to diversify, you've got to build critical mass. And five, uh, you know, there's no law around this, but call it savages law. I reckon five is the number where, yeah, if two people leave, if one person leaves an irritation, if two leaves, it's a real headache, but you've still got three. But if you've got two and two leave, you've got nothing. So you, you need to really evaluate, do you have enough income producers? Are you too reliant on just, you might have 10, but are three of them doing 80% of the billing? Are your recruiters lightweight, you know, um, good time billers? And there's nothing wrong, I'm not saying bad human beings, but, and if they've got less than two years experience, they probably are, but have you got recruiters that can really survive in a different marketplace? Do you have critical mass in your divisions? And who are the, sale, who are the sales drivers? You know, often in the, in the smaller recruitment companies, even the bigger recruitment companies, most of the sales is done by a few people, often the owners. And, and, and the rest are, while they might be called consultants, they are really just resources. They are matches. They are, they are resume flickers, whatever you want to call it. And, 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 and they will not survive in this new environment. So I think that's what I'd be thinking about when it comes to, to my actual recruiters, Mark. Thank you, Greg. You know, an interesting exercise for anyone is to uh, get a report for your board meeting with a blind print off of the length of employment of all the recruiters with the billings in every month, just in a spreadsheet. Um, and, uh, but it takes the emotion out of it, no names. And you can then look at it coldly and think, what, what do I need to do? Um, but uh, next question, Greg, what about management? Uh, so we looked at yeah. recruiters, really. Well, first of all, I want to tell you, I love that thing you just said. I've never done that, but you can consider that stolen. And I'll be introducing <laughs> that as my idea in a lot of places from now on, because I love it. Because it's so interesting you say that, because it is, it, when we look through consultants, uh, you know, billing records, so many times they say, oh, yeah, but, you know, Mary, she, the billings haven't been good, but she's been unlucky and she's, she's great for the business and she's a team player. And she might be, and you know, yes, that counts, but I love, I love the anonymous nature of it because then it's kind of stuck. So um, there you go, 40 years and you learn something new. So thanks for that, Mike, I'm gonna steal that. Now, when it comes to management, well, this, uh, I said this the other day to somebody, in fact, I think I put a video out about this yesterday. When a recession comes, what do the big recruitment companies do first? And when I say big, I mean the really big boys and girls. You know what they do first? They fire big numbers of middle management. And I like to ask myself and them if they'll listen, if you needed these people in the good times, why don't you need them in the tough times? Because surely they must be your best people. And 
I call it having a fat layer around your belly. We mustn't have huge numbers of non-billing middle management in our business. Of course, you need a marketing person. Of course, you might need an IT person or whatever. But mostly, people are billing. And if they're not billing, they're selling. CEO down. Everyone should be selling. Now, a CEO could be selling by going out and seeing senior clients or speaking at ambassadorial events, whatever he or she might be doing. But we need to be client-facing. Everybody needs to be client-facing in our business. And when I see companies gravitating to all these people on customer experience, etc., it doesn't mean to say we're not interested in customer experience just because we don't have six people whose title is customer experience. You know, that can be a responsibility of people who are dealing with customers, and it should be, actually. So um, I think that's the first the big mistake we make is we build a massive cost of people who are actually, in my view, increasingly providing less value. The other thing is that we need people in management who can coach and lead, not just management. So coaching and leadership are two very different things to managing the process. Managing the process in our business is important. But coaching, coaching is retention. If you, if you have leaders who can coach, not only will the consultants get better, but as the consultants get better, they'll feel they're getting better. And when people feel they're getting better, they feel more bonded to the business and the enterprise. Plus they earn more money because that's how our business works. So people who can coach and lead are critical. But also we need leaders in the business who can kind of productize our process. We don't want all the value in one or two or three recruiters who keep all the relationships under their, under their hat, so to speak. We want a lot of the value in the process, in the database, in, in the system. The consultants will always have a lower value, but we need to recruit, recruitment management who will do that. Um, and we need, we need management who are strong enough to understand that low margin business uh, only works if you've got your numbers right and you've got your cost base right. And I know how many arguments I've had with people who've said to me, oh, but it's $2 million worth of business. And I'm saying, but you're making no money on each transaction. And they say, we'll make it up on volume of transaction. And that is bullshit. If you're making no money on one transaction, then, and you're losing money on one transaction, you will just lose more money on multiple transactions. You have to have PSLs and, 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 and your, your, your big business profitable. And, and, and this comes from the commercial thinking of the leadership. So those are the sorts of things. All of, all of those things should be, should be in place now in the good time. Right? I had an argument with someone the other day who couldn't get off the fact that the contract they were going to take was worth $2 million. And I said, but you're going to lose money on that. But it's $2 million to our, to our revenue number. I said, but you're going, the margin is so little, you're going to lose money. That kept on coming back for $2 million. And, and that's an experienced person. Um, so it's commercial thinking. It's a sales environment. Uh, it's, it's people who can coach. It's managers who can build a process that is sustainable without relying on one or two people. And it is making sure that we, that we take business on that's commercially viable. And you'll be amazed. Well, you wouldn't like but it, it happens all the time that, that people don't. Uh, really interesting, Greg. And uh, there was a, just to reinforce your point about coaching, mm -hmm. there was a blind study mm -hmm. that I saw from Google and I think separately from Microsoft on sales managers and yeah. the output of it was the best performing sales teams had sales managers with the best coaching capability and if you think of um, you know recruitment managers get promoted no training and off you go um, so uh, crazy really but um, I'm conscious of time Greg you know I, I feel yeah. like we, yeah. we don't have enough time being with you just for you know 40 minutes or so today so uh, maybe we can do another webinar if you if you have a moment another time but for now we've got one or two more questions there what about the mindset of the yeah. owner okay so uh, in the interest of time I won't comment on what you just said which is very interesting but I'll say this about the mindset, uh, the mindset of the owner um, too easy to seduced by the good times um, sedated almost by good results and, 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 and not looking at the flimsy foundations. Um, hubris, complacency. I know these are big words. I have been guilty of. And, um, you know, sometimes people say to me, and, and I bet you'll get some emails from people saying, oh, that savage guy is pessimistic. You know, he's talking about a recession. Fuck me. I'm not pessimistic. I'm trying to save your asses by telling you about history. Um, you know, it's all about being prepared. So the mindset of, of the person is the opposite of what we've talked about today. They never run scenarios about a downturn. 
They don't, for example, have cash flows prepared for what would happen if these revenues fell. They slack on cash collection and debtors because they're making enough money that they can carry um, slow payers. Now, that's the discipline we should have as tight as anything in the good time because when the revenues drop and you've also got the compounding factor of slow payers, well, <laughs> it's a very painful place to be. Um, there is no... Um, the mindset that's lacking in, 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 in many people, which we need, is a hard-nosed, hard -nosed cold analysis of weakness. A, a lot of people don't like to uh, even entertain criticism of their own businesses. And, and we should, in fact, breed a culture of asking, why do we do it this way? Why do we do it this way? Is this still the good way? Is this best practice? We should benchmark ourselves. We should break things before some, you know, I like to say that a good owner of a recruitment company will disrupt their business with micro disruptions on an ongoing basis before somebody comes along and disrupts it in an extremely painful way for them. And that somebody could be a something, which could be a recession. Too much debt. God, the amount of high flying entrepreneurs and smart people who've told me that my balance sheet was lazy, I've got too much cash, and uh, you know, borrowed money is good money. Well, most of them are bust, and I'm not, because I, I, I want to think it's good to borrow money for smart enterprise. You don't want to be hugely in debt um, when your revenues drop. And of course, the other mindset is, uh, which we'll talk about in a moment, maybe if we've got time, is that when the revenues drop, they're too slow to act. You know, my big message is this, if you, and this is extremely difficult to do, and I failed myself many times and it's painful, but it's much better if you see a downturn and you feel a downturn to, to cut deeply and cut once than death by a thousand cuts. So I've seen it so many times. You know, oh, the revenue's dropping. We're going to have to let Betty go. Let's change the beer in the fridge from the Asahi to VB because that's cheaper. All these piddling little things um, which are meant to cut costs. No, if you can see it's happening, Everybody in the business who cannot survive in that environment will not be able to be there. We might have to close an office. We might have to do some very difficult things. But then, and it will be very dismal the day that happens. Trust me. But afterwards, motivation will soar as people realize that they're here for the long term and that we've, you've made proactive decisions to protect the business. So um, I think you should look at your points of failure. Where can your defenses be breached? Uh, and then fix those now. now. Like my cyclone analogy, you're not going to get on the roof and fix the hole in the roof when the cyclone hits. You know, you're going to have that totally, totally sorted in the good weather in preparation for the tough times ahead. Do you know, um, as you're just describing that, Greg, I'm thinking of a friend of mine, 2009, he had a 100 person recruitment business in finance. His biggest client was Lehman Brothers and um, big debt owed by Lehman Brothers to the business, which of course, uh, it very, very hard indeed. So um, in a recession, um, lessons about management style. What are your thoughts on this? Okay, well, I think um, the first thing I'd mention is you need a laser-like focus um, in a recession. Um, many times, uh, and if the people listening here have not been in a recession, they would probably do what I'm going to describe, and it would be a mistake. You get this, but you get hungry. So you're an accounting recruiter and you find you stumble across a job that's in marketing and you think, well, times are tough and our consultants aren't doing very much. We'll have a go at it. An actual factor should go the other way. I think a laser light, we should be a mile deep and an inch wide. So for example, I'll just give you some statements. Obviously, they won't apply to anyone, but they're an example, right? So you might say to the business and to everyone and, go, and, and run your business this way. We have three priorities. Guys, we are going to grow temp sales in the clerical accounting area. So I want all the guys in temp to focus on clerical accounting jobs because they do still exist. They're out there. We focus on that. Don't come to me with marketing jobs, engineering jobs, clerical accounting. Number two, 70% of our time is going to be on face-to-face -face or verbal customer communications. I want us away from our emails. We are going to get out in front of people. And number three, we only work on qualified job orders. So if the client wouldn't see you and allow you to qualify the brief, we're not taking the job. Now, I just made those three up, but I'm not bad actually. And those, that would be the way to guide a business in the recession with great clarity about our focus. The second thing is to bring people together. You know, um, 
our industry is quite selfish and individualistic. And in a recession, people get defensive and territorial. And it can, it can actually, they take their eye off the real target, which is customers and clients and competitors maybe, and they start competing with each other. So you've got to be, as a leader, um, work against the self-destructive behavior. So you bring people together, you run job meetings, you take training sessions, you, you get people to go out, you get people from the temp and the perm team or the accounting and the, and the sales team to go out on joint client visits. You don't lock yourself in the room. A great story, which is in my book, by the way, um, that I remember in the recession of uh, recruitment solutions, I had an office, and it was quite a big company with 75 staff, I had an office. Well, as the thing just collapsed in terms of revenue, jobs, and everything else, there was nothing for me to do. So I came out and I said to the guys on the PIM team, look, I'm going to pull up a chair here and sit at your desk, and I'm going to work here for the next, and I actually stayed there for two years. And I didn't do that out of a clever sense of leadership. I did it because I was bored and scared in my room, to be honest with you. And I, I thought, at least I can make a contribution as a recruiter. I was still the director, but I was recruiting. Five years later, business had recovered. We were booming. Two of the people from that era, we were drinking on a Friday afternoon, you know, like we do in this industry. And, and they, were, they were telling the story of the day I locked my office door and sat at the desk. And they said that that was the day they decided to stay with the company because I was going to be shoulder to shoulder with them in the trenches. Now, I'd love to take credit for that brilliant piece of work. It wasn't. I was actually fr frightened. Didn't have anything else to do. But it looked to them like a strong move of us working together. And, and in a recession, you've got to really, really do that. The, the, the leadership's got to be visible. You've got to be going on visits. You've got to be supporting each other. And the final thing is, is, from a management style is, uh, and again, all these things are obviously very good in good times, but in a recession, that's key, is engagement. Staff engagement, consistent communications. Don't keep, keep people, even if it's bad news. Guys, we did have to close the um, North Sydney office. Uh, we're, we're, we're very disappointed in it, but the good news is that that allows us to be strong in, in our remaining office. You know, be honest with people, constant updates, Com and, and, and informal as well. You know, cups of coffee with the people that you want, you know, make sure they're feeling supported. Uh, don't do what a lot of people do is crack the whip and go back into their office. That is not going to help you in a recession. Some thoughts there, Mike. Absolutely superb, Greg. And of course, there is, you know, th these are lessons in leadership as much as anything. Uh, you know, oh, wow. running a, uh, a business, um, fine-tuned, it feels fine-tuned to me what you're, what you're talking about here, maximizing every element of it to make it run in, in a more effective way. Um, some incredible, uh, simple thoughts there that we can all take away and do something positive with for our businesses. Um, and before I wrap up uh, on this session, and a big thank you to Greg, of course, before we do that, um, uh, I'm doing a quick um, poll. So I'm running some um, management um, training sessions uh, this week. And if you, if you put a, you can enter into a prize draw to win uh, a free place at uh, one of those sessions. All I'd like you to put in the chat room, please, is which CRM do you use? And out of 10, how do you rate it? So you can put you know, XYZ recruitment software seven. So if you put that in the chat room, please, and anyone who puts the answers in there, will go into the prize draw, which will, be, which will be announced at the end of today. And as people are doing that, Greg, um, I appreciate it. It's getting a little bit later in the evening for you. Uh, it was nice to have that be with you. I'm sure we'll have another one at some point. I hope you enjoyed the cricket despite the loss. Uh, and uh, it was great to see you again. And I look forward to working with you again on future uh, events. Uh, I'll just point out, Mike, we didn't lose the uh, series uh, and um, <laughs> we're uh, unlikely to lose. Well, actually, I shouldn't, I shouldn't talk about rugby at all. But before you go, first two things. Thank you very much. Thank you for everyone who's listening. I hope it's valuable to you. I, I have launched my book, The Savage Truth. If you go to my website, uh, there's a tab that says The Savage Book. And a lot of the stories and a hell of a lot more, it's been 40 years, uh, are in that book and it just might be useful. Uh, so please, lessons on leadership, business, and life from 40 years in recruitment. It's incredible. I suppose between you and I, Mike, we, we're probably approaching 100 years in recruitment. That's a sad thought, isn't it? <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, as you say, you, uh, a phrase that strikes me, Greg, is, and, and I think you've hit on that today, the older I get, the more I realize I don't know. 
I've got a fair amount of knowledge and so have you, but we can all improve. And, and, and the content in your book is absolutely gold. And congratulations to you for finally getting that out. Thank you, mate. Thank you. And thank you for having me on your, on your webinar. I, I, I wish you the very best and everyone in the UK. And I hope your political situation firms up uh, positively so that our industry can continue to thrive. Thanks very much. Great stuff. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Okay, cheers. Bye-bye.